Yeah, about um, the the aging and death of an event. I was uh, wondering. There there are some things like a, a, a panic attack or anxiety or depression, and um, the one of those events seem uh, they can seem kind of like recursive. Whatever triggered it. Uh, whatever contact triggered it at the start, it becomes a kind of uh, a mind object and then it becomes sort of recursive. So I was wondering uh, what, if you don't know anything about this, uh, how does it naturally, uh, quote unquote, expire such a thing? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And um, I, we worked with a woman in Seattle who had a um, serious panic attack problem. And um, panic attacks are very often, um, you know, very often panic attacks are set off by being around people. And, and, and panic attacks are not usually, I looked into this once to see if I was correct, but panic attacks are not usually primary diagnosis for a person. In other words, the pattern is usually related to something else, okay? So it would be like a person has too much tension at work. Then they go to a doctor and he says, well, you know, slow down. And then you go back to the doctor and he gives you a stress disorder as a diagnosis. And the stress disorder, if it's not handled right, can turn into a depression because you get a depression because you have a stress disorder, okay? And then when you have the, when you have the depression, is coming up, okay, depressions are known for not remaining primary diagnoses in mental health. And so very often, these, these di the diagnosis of a depression, any kind of depression, any, any level from zero to five about, it's a 10 scale, but zero to five about anyway, you tell us about those kinds of depressions, okay, um, they develop subdiagnosis. So, what's a subdiagnosis for um, a depression? First, it's um, an added amount of, of of stress, and it's like a withdrawal. The person starts to withdraw from family members or people that are used to be close around them, direct family members, and the next layer out. The direct close family and the next layer out. One and two. And they, why are they doing that? They're doing it because they see the depression as being me, mine, and myself. And it's very distressing to see my mother get sad, my grandmother get annoyed, my aunts and uncles get angry if I am behaving differently than all of them are behaving if I have a depression and I go to like a celebration. And then what happens after that is... Um, they push, the, the circles push towards you to try to help you too much. And when that happens, then panic attacks can be a subdiagnosis. Panic attacks can happen and be set off by just, you want to be alone. You've been trying to withdraw. They want you to go to the mall. They want you to shop. They want you to do this. You go out and all of a sudden you're in a mall and you have a panic attack. So if, if, no, if you haven't experienced this, let me explain. It's really rough because I went through a period of this when my, in my early 40s and it can be very rough, you know, so you're in the mall and all of a sudden you soak through your entire set of clothes. I'm not talking a little bit. I'm talking like it rained on you and your clothes are soaking wet in a panic attack. So what does a panic attack victim do when that occurs is they run to the door and they go out and hide in the car. They want to get away and they want to get away from the people. So what we did with her was we explained on the chart exactly what was happening with this um, this panic attack in her case. So let's, and I'll tell you exactly what happened with her, okay? She came into a small conference and we had to do a talk upstairs. And she went upstairs and sat in, in like the, she did it on purpose. She knew the chart. I wanna point this out, she knew the chart. So she knew about how it would, was contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth, and, and a birth of the um, reaction, okay? So what happened was she sat down in the third row of 60 people in a cluster. 
to listen to the talk Bonte was giving. Now, she did not want to move out of those 60 people. So she put herself in the middle of the group in the third row. And then she was watching very carefully exactly what was happening according to the chart. Okay. And so what happened was the feeling came up. The contact was in her mind that she mind suddenly said, you know, you're sitting in the middle of 60 people. <laughs> and um, the feeling was a horrible, painful feeling, she said. And then it moved to um, almost jumping into another circle of desperation or almost hyperventilation of, I can't stay here. I can't stay here. This is, this is, this is, um, you know, I don't like this because this is when this happens, I get afraid. And then she went into the story of why she gets afraid, because sometimes I get so afraid that I can't breathe and I can't breathe. I have to get out of here. I have to get out of here. And this is all a reaction with no real cause. And she was looking at what she would do. And she looked in the, in the library and she said, no, no, no. Sister said, close the door to the library. Well, what's, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? If I, if I close the door and I don't do that, well, then I can just let go of this and smile and let go and relax and smile and let go and relax and keep smiling toward these people and keep sending loving kindness to them and to the teacher and keep doing that. And so what happened, <laughs> what happened to that was that when she did that, so what happened to her basically was she knew what was happening because we had reviewed it with her. She challenged it to see what would happen if she sat in the middle of 60 people, if she, if she would, what she was going to do with it. She felt this whole thing happen. She was sensitive enough to feel it coming up. She started to get wet, she said. She started to perspire, but then she canceled it. She canceled it how? By saying, okay, that's not real. What's real here is I'm going to smile and let it go. Smile at it. Laugh at what's coming up. And I'm going to start sending loving kindness to myself and to the people around me and to the teacher. And she could, that was her cancellation. Do you see what happened? And she pulled out of it. And afterwards, she walked up to us absolutely bug-eyed and surprised that she could have possibly done this because she hadn't taken her medicine that day. She wanted to see what would happen. And this is what she did, you see? See, the problem in our society is when something like panic attacks start getting uh, talked getting a person falls into that as a result of depression and the route that I'm talking about, then the simple solution is to go buy the drugs because they invented drugs that'll just stop these things from happening. But that doesn't solve anything because I used to draw a picture and I used to say, look, in one country, they were handling mental health in the United States strictly by the PDR manual, the Physician's Drug Reference Manual. And so everything was about give them a drug and they'll behave. It's like, you know, that's what will control everybody. But that wasn't teaching them anything. At the same time, over in the UK, they were ahead of us. And they were doing things like, you want to get up and have a, a violent fit? Okay, we'll, well, we'll put you in a room full of plastic furniture and padded stuff. You can't hurt yourself and everybody else will leave the room and you just go till you're finished. That's what they were doing. You can't hurt yourself. There was no way you could hurt yourself in these places. We talked to a number of people that were there. And then the other thing, they were refusing to just put a person on a drug for the rest of their life to solve a problem without understanding what it was. But then eventually, I think the drugs got over there more and more. I should ask you about this, you know, but the drugs got over there more and more. And now it isn't as different because the drug companies are so powerful, you know. So, but the people themselves should demand to know from a doctor, you know, what exactly is happening to me and not have a doctor who, who decides, oh, this is too complicated for me to explain to you. I'm not going to share this with you. I'm going to do this with you instead. You see, it's the same thing that happens kind of in Buddhism, where if, if um, I hear this all the time, you know, well, you can't teach the people what I'm teaching them. 
because they're too stupid and they can't learn it. I've even had one say they're so stupid, they'll never learn it. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I have too much experience knowing that almost anybody can learn what we're talking about right now. You learned about your stomach, didn't you? You learned about your intestines and your heart and your blood system, didn't you? When you went into health class in high school, didn't you? Didn't you learn about having headaches and stomach aches and things like that, right? And you learned kind of what was happening. And we learned about going through puberty, didn't we? So what is so difficult about talking about this portion of your body, see, and giving us a little information that you have known since the 70s actually is when they started it all, but they didn't let anybody really know they knew it until the 90s. And they still won't let it out and they won't let it in the schools. So it's, an, it's, an, it's sort of a mystery what it's all about, why we have to pretend that our bodies go this high <laughs> and this is not part of it. <laughs> and yet the, the, you know, these, I see this comical thing of this is a little window and you look in and there's all these little soldiers in there and then the main control center for the body and everything's happening inside the brain. And they're pretending like it doesn't even exist. And we can make it so you don't feel your brain and that solve your problem until the night happens where you wake up and the bottle is empty. And then you can't call the doctor, he's on vacation, <laughs> or you can't call anybody else, it's a big holiday. And then you fall in the pit and you're depressed and scared. How are you gonna get out if you don't have some kind of knowledge about what's actually happening? That's the big one, isn't it? You see what I'm talking about? So, Panic attack is a matter of understanding how this happened to her, okay? Step by step. You're sitting someplace. If you've had panic attacks, it's horrible because <laughs> when that happened to me, I, I was ill and I had some medication given to me, which made me so down and out of it. It made everybody mad. And then this happened with the panic attacks. And you know who saved my life in the end? my daughter. <laughs> and do you know why? She wanted me to take her when I came, you know, back home, she wanted me to take her to the mall to shop for shoes. This is all about the shoes. And she, she said, I'm going to fix this. And I said, how are you going to fix this? Well, you can drive me over here. I said, it's not a problem. But when you send me in the store, I have exactly 10 minutes the first time I was in the store and I had to leave and get back in the car. Then later, 15 minutes. And she said, we're going to keep going until you can go in and buy the shoes. <laughs> it was really funny. And I said, okay, we'll play the game. You know, and we kept going to the mall again and again. And I would almost cry because I didn't want to get out and walk into that building with all those people just all around you and the noise and everything. I didn't want to do that. But by keep keeping on more time, more time, enough time to get lemonade. <laughs> and then enough time to eat lunch. And then enough time finally to buy a pair of shoes. It was a game. And look what she did. She retrained my brain through um, repetitive action of parking the car and going in amongst the people until the people didn't, it didn't matter anymore, see? And then you move out of it, you see? The thing to remember if you are suffering from panic attacks is of course the first part of that, the one part of that training is Chichaka Sutta and just read it and read it and read it because this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is something that is happening as a result of a cause and an effect. And the cause has to do with fear and fear can be overcome. There's a fear that comes up and the fear has to be overcome and you have to laugh at fear in your face. You laugh at it, you make it a game. I don't care what anybody else does. I don't care if you look silly or I look silly or anything else. We were just laughing at it in the end, the two of us. And that was before I was Buddhist, see? Now I'm Buddhist and I'm teaching this stuff and I'm listening to neural, um, you know, 
neurosurgeons talk about this and people who are working with brain research and stuff. And when we're all reading this research, all it takes is to repetitively teach the brain, this is a lie and put something else in place of it, replace it and laugh. Because the moment you laugh, you're not afraid anymore. Do you remember the song I told you about? You remember that song? Uh, no. Whenever I, it's from the king and I, you know, whenever I feel afraid, I hold myself erect and I whistle a happy tune and no one will suspect I'm afraid. The result of this deception is very strange indeed. For when I fool the people I fool, I fool myself as well. So you whistle a happy tune and you hold yourself erect and listen to the happy tune and soon you won't be so afraid. And that's it. You play games. Nobody ever told you ever you could not be a little kid playing games. You just think that happened. It's, it's a myth. Nobody told any of us adults we could not take our shoes off and go down out of the car in the middle of nowhere and go sit beside a stream and put our toes inside, or that we could drive down and park by the ocean and go sit on the edge and just make drip castles. Yeah? Only don't do it in India. It's just too dirty, the ocean. <laughs> You don't want to do it here. You don't want to do it. I mean, you can walk on it, but it's real different. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not um, afraid of it, but I was a little concerned because there were so many hermit crabs. And every time we were walking on the sand, they're biting your toes. <laughs> yeah, but you have to have fun in life. Don't take it so seriously. There's nothing serious here. If there was something serious here, somebody would have made a million dollars by now writing a book about life is serious. <laughs> you know, something like that. They would have written a book like that and made millions. But it's not true. It's all in our head. That's the truth. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. When there is um, agitation um, yeah. of, of any sort, so the mind is really active. Yep. Is, is there um, an actual increase in, let's say, increase in consciousness? Or is it, does it just seem more active? Or I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to express this. Do, do, do you get what I'm uh, yeah, so um, let's see if I can find this. Hold on, there's a sutta that's about agitation. I'm going to pinpoint that one. It's 138. Udesa Vibhanga Sutta is the way to agitation and non agitation. Okay. So this one actually is about hindrance management. And um, what it's talking about the mind in two different ways. Okay. And the first way is distracted when the mind is distracted and scattered externally. And the second way is when it's not distracted and scattered externally. Okay. And then um, stuff happens internally. And then it's about being stuck internally or not stuck internally. So what does it sound like it means distracted and scattered because a hindrance comes up, something comes up outside and it starts bothering you externally means that you're distracted and scattered externally, okay? And here, when um, a student has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness follows after the sign of the form, uh, is tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of the form. You're in involved in the form that comes up outside and is fettered by the fetter of gratification of the sign of the form. You're, you're occupied with it con constantly. You're caught by it. Then his consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. But... Um, when he has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness does not follow after the sign of the form, 
In other words, if something's going up, isn't on out there and you don't pay attention to it, it is not tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of the form, is not you know, involved in it right away, jumping right into it, paying attention, is not fettered by the fetter of gratification of the sign, then his consciousness is called not distracted and, and scattered externally. So then it goes, it does this with the eye, then it does it with the sound, it does it with the nose, with the, t with the flavor of the tongue, and with the body and with the mind objects all the way through, okay? So okay. So basically, the solution to this is to see it and let go of it. And when you're working in the jhanas, it happens that you get involved in where you're inside your meditation and then you're practicing and you get stuck on something inside. And that's where you're now stuck internally and you have to let go of these things and relax and smile and come back to what you're doing inside your practice. So in relationship to your practice, is this in relationship to your practice or is it in relationship to your job or life? What's it in relationship to? Uh, this is not in relation to practice or not yet in relation to practice. Okay, but where's the agitation that you're talking about? What kind of agitation? Like, give me a situation or hypothetical. Okay, um, so an agitation of, um, let's say, agitated people around you, for example, which is then taken uh, up. Now, when you're talking agitation, you're talking restlessness and unpeacefulness in your mind, right? Okay, so if you know the formula that Bhante is just talking about, you, your, alter, your counter to this is, I have a peaceful mind. You say, wait a minute, I have a peaceful mind. And your peaceful mind is to use the six R's and get out of this and counter it. So if somebody is, is in agitation, Okay, you can, and you're going to stay around them, okay, or you have to stay around them for some reason, okay. You, you look at the elements of how this is actually put together, like Bonte's describing, and, and you see that this is a form of restlessness and unpeacefulness in the mind, your mind. They're triggering something. Now, another thing about this is, if, it's, if you keep a little notebook, if this is somebody that you see very often and this situation happens again and again, when you go home, write down what happened and exactly what you what came up for you and what you did. Then this happens a few more times a week. Do that each time. At the end of the week, if you look at that notebook, you might find out that you're using the same reaction over and over and over again, like it's on a loop on the computer, on you know, on the internet, some waterfall that just keeps going. <laughs> you know, and it's a tiny clip of a waterfall. And once you see what that is, you need to start laughing <laughs> because you just spotted what this is coming from. And it's tapping into something that whatever, the agitation is funny because the agitation, it tips you off. It triggers a, um, what did I call that before? It triggers your reaction and agitation is a reaction and it triggers that reaction by a memory of being something like something else. Usually when agitation plays out, just like anger plays out, we are usually living it, doing it through 85% of our lives is dipping into the being library and pulling out the reaction and playing it again and again and again. See, does this sound familiar? And you know, uh, I mean, it would, uh, I'll just tell yeah. you one more thing about the uh, journal uh, which you keep. Uh, if you are keeping a diary or something like that, of the, uh, there's one other advantage is there that you also notice what are the changes in the positive direction also which is going through. So when you are doing uh, a, a kind of a record of it, 
sometimes buddha says that uh, that if you are using a axe say you don't uh, one day you re, uh, notice there is an uh, uh, grip mark on the axe uh, handle that grip mark you don't know when it uh, came this much came this day this much came that day you will not be able to know but after using it for say a few months you will have a grip mark so sometimes what happens is we cannot uh, kind of uh, judge for ourselves what the positive changes we have happened so by keeping a diary you also notice how your positive changes have come so that also helps you uh, know that oh in the first of the uh, uh, say november i reacted this way uh, but on the 30th of november i reacted in this way so that also helps so uh, keeping a diary is kind of a very good um, advice yes sister kema <laughs> yeah that's a good one that's a good one now in this sutta there's a section on just being agitated and not agitated it says it like this an agitated mind states are born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness and do not arise together and remain obsessing the mind because his mind is not obsessed he is not anxious distressed and concerned <coughs> and due to non clinging he does not become agitated and that is how there is non agitation due to non clinging but when you cling to something when something comes up uh when something comes up and you hold on to it agitated states of mind are born of the preoccupation with the change of the consciousness arising together and remaining obsessing the mind so the moment something happens you need to laugh that's my advice just laugh at the fact that you feel agitated and let it go by because what do you know about what do you know about anicca anicca is impermanence right anicca means but better than impermanence we think about oh this building it's impermanent you know this everything's impermanent oh ho ho but that it's not like that part we're really interested in what we're really interested in is impermanence is the total flux of the entire universe everything is moving all the time you see the taxi driver was in trouble in the taxi driver story okay uh, because he wouldn't let go of something that had happened only a couple hours before i got in the cab he was going to carry it on the whole time i'm in the cab he called his wife on the phone to make sure she knew about it he was going to carry it home and lament it to his mother-in-law and everybody else and he would have had hours and hours and hours of sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair out of a man that got in his cab and tried to boss him around okay until i told him the ridiculousness of holding on to something that changed cuz i'm in the cab <laughs> and i had him laughing about it he thought it was silly he did that you see so when you punch hit you agitation just laugh at yourself and say no i'm going to change it and in the in number 4 sabasava sutta is saying if this is happening then change it if you have an uh an obsessed mind then say i'm going to have an unobsessed mind if i don't have any peace because i'm agitated i'm going to have a peaceful mind so you laugh at it and said that's silly i'm going to have a peaceful mind that agitation has already happened right it's already gone so what we don't realize about the past persistently we don't realize about the past when we talk about it everything we just did on here is past <laughs> right now it's past it doesn't mean past lifetimes and past this and past you know eons and kalpas and heavens and this life and that life it doesn't mean that it's talking about what just went by why are we still carrying it and you know what you did when you grabbed a hold of it and you got involved with it you reached over and you took it and you stuck it in your backpack <laughs> you see in your backpack was carrying all your past around you stuck it in there and next time somebody comes around that is similar to what agitated you they're going to reach in there and you're going to use it again and then throw it back in there again because you don't know that you can hang up your backpack and refuse to use it and your front pack worries about the future you can put them on another hook and ask imaginary hooks you know one of the best talks i ever gave in a church i was in was about the old man who was having a rough time and losing his job but his wife and kids they didn't know anything was wrong at all and people said why why is everything going so well at home 
And he said, because when I leave uh, the office and when I get home, I take my coat off and I hang it up very carefully. And it was his backpack, see, he's talking about. And then I put my shoes there and I put my hat up there. And that was the one about the future. And then I go in the house. They had a vestibule and you hung your clothes up. Then you walked in the door to the house. And when I was home, nothing was wrong at all. I was perfectly happy. And then I could carry that to the office afterwards. I take it to work and I would do the best I could to get through the day. But I always hung it up before I came home for the family. It was a talk about family, you know, relationships and harmony in the home. As before, I knew that he really should have put it in a trunk and locked it away. <laughs> I didn't know that yet. You see, I'm willing to let you hang it up first and see what it feels like without it and then pick it up tomorrow and hang it on your back again if you want to. But honestly, it all comes back to me. It all comes back to you, to us personally. We do this to ourselves. See, the person, watch this, the person in this case, if it's a person, they didn't agitate you. Nothing happened to you. You agitated yourself by having a personal view about the agitation. How about that? You see it? <laughs> and now you have to go, oops, you know, I miss you. So, so that's why if you look in four in Savasava, you can see where they were playing this um, counteract. If you're afraid, you say you'll be courageous when you sit in the forest, you see? If you're too hot, one time I sat with a group of people and all we did was close our eyes and think about a snowstorm in a football field and we got cool. <laughs> it really worked. She did that to us, this leader. She had us all sit there and think about snow in a football field. And we were in a Quaker center, a little Quaker, church center, you know, with no air conditioning and 92 degrees outside. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So our mental, what we do to ourselves mental, we're doing it. <laughs> we're not, we don't have any reason to poke anybody, you know. So got it? You know what you're going to do now, right? Go out and buy this little notebook right away and keep it in your pocket, okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're good, Edward. Thank you. Yeah.